So are you getting books sent home for your child to read and packets to do that like you don't understand the questions, let alone how to help your child figure it out? Um, this is very frustrating for parents because you're a parent first, right? You're not a teacher. However, now that we're experiencing the school in our homes, we have to kind of figure out some things that we can do to help our kids be more successful with all the work that they're being sent home. So I'd love for you to say hi in the box where you're watching us from and let us know, is your child getting more packets, more online kinds of learning activities or a combination of both? Um, because we're going to be talking about how to make accommodations and modifications in a pretty easy, simple way, because we have an expert with us today. And Nicole, hello. Like, pause. It's like Eric's, right? <laughs> Eretics, yeah. Eretics. <laughs> Eretics. That's right. Um, yeah. He has been on our show before. And when I was thinking about how we can help parents figure out some accommodations or modifications at home, I thought Nicole is the perfect guest for this because she has written a book called, <laughs> if I can get it here, Vision <laughs> in Action. And this is going to be our giveaway book. So when you make comments, you will have a greater chance of winning at the book, winning the book at the end of our show today. Um, so make sure your comments are coming. If you would like to get additional resources emailed to you, just type the word learning in the chat box and we'll get that for you. And just to tell you a little bit about Nicole, she was an inclusion teacher she is from Canada. She now lives in the United States. She has a college age daughter. <laughs> it's like, so lots of things going on in her life too, right? When your college age kids have to move back home. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Good stuff. But yeah. you might have heard Nicole at a conference because she does a lot of speaking across North America. Um, or you might have heard one of her podcasts, read her blog posts, been on her Facebook page, which let me show you. You guys have to go over and like her Facebook page and go to her website, theinclusiveclass.com. Um, but Nicole is going to be sharing with us some ideas that she has kind of invented or created um, some of the <laughs> from other people, right? Borrowed, <laughs> yep. Why reinvent the wheel? <laughs> kind of tweak and adapted. Yeah. And um, so Nicole, welcome. And thank you for thank taking you. that time in this busy, confusing, hectic life of ours to come with us today. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. I fully understand what um, the challenges that parents are faced with these days um, with the online learning and, you know, trying to keep up with homework and just it's a whole new routine and parents are expected to, um, you know, deliver all of this content material in a way that their child can learn it. And it's just a, it's a very overwhelming time. And even though I have a college age daughter, and then I also have a son who's older than that, but he's waiting to go into graduate school. Um, so he's not actually in school, but um, my college age daughter, she came home and she's trying to do the online learning and it's tough for her. And she's been yeah. at this, you know, for years and um, she has a very unique learning style and it's, it's challenging. And I've even had to um, help her, you know, set up her area and yeah. decide what tools work best for her. And it's just a lot of guesswork at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I hope today I can take some of that guesswork out of it and give some parents some ideas and places to start. And um, yeah, so I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm, I'm excited. Would you like to go over to your slides? Sounds good. Let's All do right. that. Okay, I'm just going to pull mine. Yeah, so, um, so the biggest thing that I've, I've really sort of, you know, discovered and, and realized is that 
when a child is interacting with their homework, it's not just about when they respond to it. They're interacting with it while it's being presented. And I find that a lot of kids traditionally have been just asked to sit and watch or listen or um, pay attention to the content that's been delivered to them. Now that works for some kids, very few kids. <laughs> and uh, there are the rest of us that it, it's difficult to really tune in and pay attention and engage with the content when it's just being directly given to us. So I like to really encourage teachers and now of course parents to think about what your child is doing while the content is being presented. Are they just sitting there and listening? Is that working for them? If it is, great. If it's not, you'll know right away, obviously, because they're, you know, fiddling with something, looking around, um, you know, not paying attention. So what you want to do is try and get them engaged with what's happening and what, what they're learning and what the content is being um, given to them, you know, what's happening at that time. So there are several ways that you can do that. Now, of course, some of these ideas uh, assume that you might have the material ahead of time. And some of them, of course, uh, you know, you can do on the, as the material is being delivered. So I've got a few slides here to show you, to give you some examples of what your child can be doing while they're listening to the content. So depending on their age and their ability level, you can give them an outline of the lecture so that the student fills in some of the key points while they're doing the lesson, while they're listening to the lesson. So for example, I mean, you can even do something as simple as um, first, and then, you know, print the word first, and then a line, and then the child is listening to the content, and, you know, here's something that is significant and worth writing down. And you'll probably want to prompt them through this until they, you know, are capable of doing it on, on their own, or you might just want to prompt them, you know, throughout. And then, so you've got the word first, and then, um, what's happening, and then next, and then another sort of space for them to fill out what's the, what they're learning, and then the word finally, and then a space for them to fill out what they're learning. So just a very simple outline of what's happening and what they're engaged with in the, on the screen. Um, the next one is doing a and a So for example, if the student has, or if your child has watched the content online, um, Afterwards, just do a quick Q and A with them to see, just to check their understanding, or even have them if the if the um, you know lecture the lesson is being recorded, you can even just stop the recording and say, you know, do you understand such and such and such and such, or you know what happens when, or what did you think about this? But give them some questions just to kind of prompt their thinking and to trigger their attention too. <laughs> um, Another way to have them engage with the material is, is also to do a true and false. So for example, once again, if, if it's a recorded uh, situation, you can have them stop the recording and just give them a quick true and false answer or question and have them answer it. Now this is assuming of course, that you're able to sit within a, you know, uh, a distance of your child and, and pay attention along with them. Um, if you're not able to do this, then you know I've got other strategies to support them. Uh, the next idea is to do a concept map. So while they're listening to the material, and this is something that actually you don't need to be around for, um, but it's also helpful to teach them how to do this before the lesson. But while they're listening to the lesson, they can be making um, a brainstorming map or a concept map where they put the main idea in on a piece of paper and then just as they're listening to the lesson they're branching off with their own thoughts or or material that they've heard or um you know things that they've learned so that's a very easy thing to do uh if this is so for example a live um online lesson and then of course oh the video instruction we'll just skip that because <laughs> that's already happening <laughs> And then uh, previewing the concepts. And once again, this is this is assuming that you have access to the material or the concepts that the student is going to learn. And this is when you would go over what they're going to learn before the actual lesson. So those are some ideas to uh, give your student, your child, 
in order to help them engage with the material, which will help them retain the concepts and um, will help them have a deeper understanding of what they're learning. Those are great ideas. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, now, just uh, here's a quick resource uh, going back to the concept map. Now, um, this came from the source that you see below here on the screen. This is Judy. Oh, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. <laughs> I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> but what you'll find on her site are various um, what we call graphic organizers. And these are other ways to have your student, your child um, retain material either during the lesson or shortly after, or even beforehand in some cases, if you want to do a preview of the material with your child. So you can print these graphic organizers off and the child can be working on them, or you can even make them yourself. I mean, I've just even, you know, done that piece of paper and a pen and draw, you know, two of the, you know, a couple of the bubbles for the concept map or do a T-chart for the, for the student. And the T-chart can be used for the true or false questions. Um, you know, there's all sorts of various ways that you can use these graphic organizers. And it just really helps kids visualize and, and uh, work with the material that they're learning. And, sorry, did you have a question for me? Uh, no, I was just thinking, I, I really like graphic organizers for myself. <laughs> I know. know. But, you know, and I remember when I was teaching that um, what was interesting, and I had learned this from a speaker, and Doug Fisher, who's a professor yeah. at San Diego State, and he was talking about making sure kids know the different kinds of graphic organizers that there are. But then getting to the point where students can then decide which graphic organizer would help me the most in this situation. Exactly. Um, but I think probably a lot of parents are familiar with the graphic organizers that teachers use to help kids figure out what they're going to write about, right? So writing prompts and um, I know the app Kidspiration or yeah. Inspiration. Yeah, that can be a really valuable resource as far as, you know, applying the graphic organizer to different things. Yes, yeah, exactly. And it's, um, yeah, and a graphic organizer, like you said, we commonly see it in writing situations, but they are being used across the curriculum now because mm -hmm. there's such value to um, how they help kids organize material and give them an understanding of the material. So you can use it with, you know, social studies, science, even um, math concepts. So it's really, you know, having them, um, giving them various ways to, to interact with that content is really key. So. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Now, um, the next slide that I have here, too, this is just another, um, this would be something that you could do um, beforehand and this is going back to having choice uh giving your student or giving your child a choice really gives them ownership over the content that they're learning and it's it gives them responsibility for learning the content and the way that you can give them choice is you can give them something such as this tic-tac-toe choice board now this is very visually overwhelming for some and you can even just start by giving them a choice of two items and then move up to three items or four items. But this is basically a choice um, in this example of how they'd like to respond to the material or how they'd like to, you know, after they've learned the material, they can, uh, you know, do definitions, do a drawing, do a song, a flashcard, but you can make up your own really, depending on what is being asked of them in the material. But giving kids choice over what they're um, like what they're learning is really, really important too. It's another aspect of just helping them take, you know, helping them really grasp onto those concepts. So and and it just makes it more enjoyable too <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> when, they, when they see that they have some options. <laughs> yes. Right. So, yeah. Now, um, so those are some ideas for getting your child uh, working with the content. So then what happens after that content has been delivered? And then they've got to actually do the, the, the work. And in, I'm hoping that for most of our listeners, your child has work that has been um, 
uh, adapted and modified for them if necessary. Um, I'm hoping that they have work that's appropriate, but if they are struggling or if the work is not at their ability level and it's left to you or you would prefer to modify it yourself, then I've got some ideas coming up here for you. So I'll move to the next screen. Is there anything that you wanted to address before I move on? No, that's fine. Okay. So um, when we look at adapting work, and I, most parents will know this because of the IEP meetings and um, the 504 meetings that they've been in, but um, there are two ways to adapt work. And the first way is to give um, accommodations, allow the child to interact and to gain access to the material in various ways. It doesn't change, doesn't fundamentally change what they're going to learn. It doesn't change the curriculum that they're learning. But what it does is it gives kids greater access to the material. So this would be for your child who understands the content and can work with the material, but they're just struggling or they're not quite um, able to fully grasp what's being presented in terms, you know, maybe visually or, um, you know, hearing wise, or even um, if they can, you know, um, show what they know, for example, after. So, you know, in terms of response, these are some accommodation ideas that you can do to help your child access the material. So, um, so one of the things I was going to say, um, Nicole, is a lot of schools in the United States, I don't know if they're doing this also in Canada, but um, are creating, they're called distant learning plans or, you know, continuous learning plans for the time period when schools are closed. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that you could, you know, as a parent, what you could do is check what accommodations are currently listed in your child's IEP. Pick out the ones that are going to be most appropriate and helpful for you at home mm -hmm. and then talk you know, have a phone call, have a Zoom meeting with your child's um, teachers, both general ed and special ed, and say, how can we make sure the work being assigned have these accommodations embedded? Um, so just to kind of remind people that we need to make sure that we're using and teachers are helping parents use accommodations at home and have them written in that distant learning plan. So everybody is on the same page about what's gonna be helpful right now. Yes, exactly. And then of course, uh, there might be things in there that, you know, I mean, obviously parents know their child best and so they're able to adapt and depending on what their child needs that day. So. So yeah, so here are some sort of, you know, alternate suggestions or other suggestions if you, you know, would like to offer more opportunities for your child to, right. to access the curriculum. So here they are um, now, and I'm thinking in terms of, some of these might be more school situated. I, I pulled these slides from a presentation that I did recently. So uh, some of these might be more uh, pertaining to the school setting as opposed to home setting, but you know, you can, you can decide what works for you. But here are some ways just to support your student um, or your child in their environment. So, for example, ensuring that they have a quiet space to work, um, creating a study barrier. Now, I don't know if uh, I recently did a post, a blog post on the inclusiveclass.com, and it was tips to help your child learn at home. And on that post is a picture of a homemade um, study barrier that um, parents can easily put together using cardboard. It doesn't need to be a big sturdy desk like the one you see here, the study carol you see here. And I've got an, an example of that on the next um, slide, but that's what I'm referring to is just some way to block off the visual distraction, the visual noise around the child. Um, the lighting is a big issue. You can, for some children, you can definitely play with the lighting in your, your child's work area. Um, you know, whether you're drawing the blinds or turning on or off lights. 
uh, having them sit in different areas around the home. I know my daughter, she moves from room to room throughout the day. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know which room she's in. So I have to go, you know, where is she now? But she she moves around. She's got, you know, four or five different locations in the house that she'll move to depending on, you know, how restless she gets or, you know, what her needs are. Um, and then of course, you know, the types of seating that you're offering your child and, and what they would prefer. I mean, some kids would like to sit on a nice sturdy desk chair, you know, sort of a desk type chair, chair meant for a desk, or um, other kids would prefer or work best in a beanbag chair or on the couch, or, you know, just kind of thinking about ways to 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 have them sit to do their work. So those are some examples. And um, this is the study barrier that I was just talking about earlier, just a piece of cardboard. And uh, now, of course, this is really jazzed up. But <laughs> well, and kids like to do that, right? I mean, they like to decorate it and yeah. add their personal touch. So yeah, yeah. I mean, that can be a fun at home activity to do. Um, yeah. Reuse one of your Amazon boxes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when you get your Amazon order, <laughs> eventually get it. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, have the have the child work with you on it and have them create their own their own space and have their materials. Of course, you can see their materials are all there and available. So you don't have to go tracking it down every day. Um, I'll move to the next slide. And then, of course, we've got some various ways that they can respond to the material. So it doesn't just need to be paper pencil work. They can. Um, you know, this might already be in your child's IEP, of course, but here's some, you know, if, if you don't have any of these, there's here's some more ideas, basically. <laughs> you might already have all this in your child's IEP, but, um, but basically in how they respond to the materials. So you can, if they're doing something where on this example here, they're doing a kind of reading passage and then there's a fill in the blank. Now, what I would do to take this a step further is, um, now it looks like they've got the word there. Oh, they, oh, I know what they want to do here. They want the child to put in the past tense of that word. But you can even have the word, the words underneath in a word bank for the child to choose from, and then they just fill in the blank. Um, you can also have them use, you know, do their work on a computer. You can uh, scribe for them, which means you write the answers for them. Um, of course, the graphic organizers. So the child doesn't just need to, you know be expected to just write down the answer with pen and paper. I mean, there are other ways to show what you're learning. Um, right. So it's not set in stone. There are other ways. And here's some um, sort of ways that, that the child can interact with the material in terms of responding to it. So if you see on the left-hand side, the student is doing some math on the iPad and what they've got um, a graphic organizer right there huh. to help them, you know, understand what's happening with the material using the manipulatives and a graphic organizer. And then down in the right hand corner is an example of adapted, or sorry, of, an, of a writing tool that's been adapted. It's just a pen inside a tennis ball and um, to help the child with the writing. So um, here's some more ideas. Definitely, you know, you can think about the kind of paper that your child is working on, um, you know, different line paper. And you can, there's all sorts of examples online. If you go to Google and just type in, you know, lined paper, um, you'll see all sorts of different examples that you can pull up and print off. And then of course, uh, and this is another example of using graph paper, you know, a way that you can use graph paper to help your child organize a math problem, for example. Well, and you know, I've heard from some parents that they're getting some, you know, links for things, but they're then they're finding difficulty actually printing off the, you know, the paper or the, you know, activity. Right. So one of the things that you could do is you could, um, you know, talk again to your child's teacher and request that they send you know, a bundle of this special handwriting paper or the graph paper home, um, because sometimes we're running out of ink, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And Amazon isn't delivering ink very fast. Yes, <laughs> so exactly. Certain papers like that, that your child has used at school, ask the teacher to send that to you in a packet. Um, yeah. That would be really helpful. Yeah. 
And also too, I just noticed that um, one of our our listeners today, um, Raylene Taylor, she just noted that SnapType is a great app for uh, helping um, students with the work. Uh, it, I totally agree. And that's actually a resource I was going to suggest later on. And I, and I can show this the screenshot of how it works, but basically it kind of replaces that whole written portion of, of the assignment where the student can actually type in, you know, right. The response. And it is, it is so easy to use. I mean, you take a picture of the worksheet and it comes up like on your tablet and yeah. the, the child can type the answers in. So exactly. yeah, if your child, you know, has things like that, that they use at school, you know, make sure your teacher shares that with you because sometimes all those specific things aren't listed on the IEP for you to know about, but ask exactly. the teacher, what other tips and tricks are they using at school? Let okay. me know what the apps are so I can have them also, you know, use it at home. Yeah. You didn't steal my thunder, Raylene. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're all in this together. <laughs> I learned from you as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, definitely. And, and thank you for reemphasizing the fact that it's really important to to work with your child's teacher, you know, at, use use that resource, even though you're at home and you're, you know, thinking about what you're doing in, in your home environment, your teacher is there to help you and to support and and has the resources and the ideas. And yeah. And don't forget to plug into what they've got to offer. Right. So, right. Um, I'll just go through a few more quick accommodations and then I'll talk about actually modifying the work. So, which is a different um, kettle of fish altogether. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, here are some more ways to support your child when they're working with the material or even accessing the material is giving them, um, you know, then this might already be part of your child's IP, but the reduced workload. Now this would, obviously be prearranged with your child's teacher. Um, but maybe just having, you know, this would be an example of maybe doing three questions instead of 10, you know, but having them show what they know in a reduced amount. Um, right. You know, keeping an agenda or, or a routine for the day even with, with is, is a tremendous help. Um, checking your child's work as they go along, giving them some immediate feedback. Those are all sort of little prompts that you can do to help the child stay on track and help them stay goal oriented and focused on what they need to be doing. Yeah, and I've noticed in the the packets that my grandkids have been getting, some of the teachers have made really nice checklists, <laughs> um, yes. boxes to check it off. Yes. And so if your child is one of those, I love to cross it out or check it off. Yeah. You know, if they have a bundle of work to do, you can write up a simple just paper pencil checklist for your child. Um, and sometimes that helps kids stay on top of it and they know you know, look, I've already got more than half of this done. I don't have much more to go, you know, yeah. something like that. I wish I had um, put this on PowerPoint, but to share with you, I can actually probably post it maybe later on. Um, my daughter came up with this great idea for herself because when she first came home, she was not motivated at all. And, you know, and I was trying to give her checklists and, you know, have her, you know, I was looking for apps all over the phone to try and help her organize her work. But she actually came up with this idea on her own. And I was like, wow, this is really great. But so what she did is she basically took a poster board and then she divided it into to the sections according to the subject subjects that she's learning. So she has three courses that she's taking. So she divided it into thirds. And then what she did was on, um, uh, oh my gosh, why am I? I'm drawing a blank, <laughs> a sticky note, you know. <laughs> yeah, so on a yellow sticky note, she wrote down a job that she had to do for that course. So whether it was, you know, read a page or um, respond to a chapter and she put it on a sticky note and put it in, in underneath that course, right? So she created this checklist, but with sticky notes. And so as she went through and did the jobs, she just takes off the sticky note and puts it down, you know, and takes it off, right. tumbles it up, throws it in the garbage. But it's really, oh. uh, it's a very interactive way of, 
you know, doing a checklist, right? As, and and she loves just going up and just ripping the sticky note off and getting rid of it all together rather than seeing. <laughs> well, and that's the <laughs> thing. And then they, you know, she's got ownership, right? I mean, totally. as a mom, it's like, oh, okay, we'll write a checklist. Well, no, maybe that's not what she wants, right? So, yeah, yeah I think that's a great point to, you know, involve the kids into how do you want to keep track of this? You know, exactly. a simple, you know, pocket folder with to do and done and you put the yep. papers in the right place. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. And just something real simple like that or a paper clip, all the done ones and paper yep. clip, all the ones to do, but yep. some way to help your child stay organized because especially if you have more than one child and everybody's got things that you're trying to keep track of, oh it can goodness. be pretty frantic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, and I'm a big, um, I'm a big supporter and promoter of color coding things too. Yes. I find that color coding um, really streamlines a lot of the organizational process with your kids work, um, whether, you know, especially if you have more than one child that you're working with, but, you know, have one child work with all of, you know, if you can, and if you have it around your house, I mean, even the dollar store, you know, well, they're not open, but you know, on, on Amazon, um, you can get or the colored, different colored store. grocery yeah. store, yeah, colored baskets, different colored, um, you know, bins, just things, stickers, even, uh, you can, you know, I've used those, those dot stickers to put on various supplies just to keep kids um, focused on what is their stuff and not get distracted with everybody else's stuff. Right. So it just makes, keeps things moving along a lot quicker. <laughs> yes. So yeah, color coding is huge. Um, and here are just some more examples of, um, you know, keeping your child on track with time. Uh, some parents may already do this, but having a visual schedule. So I talked about a routine and an agenda, but putting that um, down in a visual way so that your child knows what to expect and what what time is allotted and then of course I don't know if, if any parents have this at home but these visual timers are amazing I love this I actually use it for myself when I do um, <laughs> presentations and speaking and um, even just work is to have a visual timer and I just got one on Amazon and it was it was pretty inexpensive but it really helps uh, show the child how much more time visually they have you know that they can they can keep you know working on does anybody have one of these at home I don't know if if anyone's using one of these but they're fabulous just you know just a little heads up though my daughter did try to find a way to circumvent me by actually <laughs> moving the timer when I wasn't looking so just a heads up your kid might try and do that <laughs> those, those kids with the good problem solving skills. oh let me tell you <laughs> yeah I tried many things with her but she she manages to find a way um and in the end, what works best for her is something that she's eventually come up with. So there good, you go. <laughs> good lesson as a parent. Um, so I'll just move uh, quickly here. Yeah. So now sort of the last kind of big way that you can help your child um, get to the material and learn it and understand it, you know, give them a highlighter to highlight off sections of the work that they're doing. And you can use different colored highlighters as shown in the example here. Um, Give them cues and prompts. Uh, mnemonics is a big one too. Do you ever talk about that, Charmaine, using mnemonics when a child is learning? Yeah, that is like really helpful. I mean, yeah. you can think about, you know, the ones that we've used, you know, as kids, like the colors of the rainbow or the Great Lakes, yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah. different things. But those yeah. kinds of technique, you know, that technique can really be helpful for kids. Yeah, so it's basically taking the first, so taking the first letter of a word, right? And then you're coming up with a saying. So for uh, the one that I always think of is North, South, East, West. And I always think of never eat soggy wheat. So North, huh. East, <laughs> South, West, yeah. <laughs> so that's the mnemonic I always remember that comes to my mind that I learned when I was younger, but. Yeah, using mnemonics is a fun way to have kids um, just have a deeper understanding of that material. And of course, just different size text, you know, maybe the text that they're looking at, it, it's too small. I mean, you can use, um, or even just tracking, for example, tracking words as they're reading. So here's an example on the left hand side, it's a bit blurry, but of a way that a student can track their work and it's just with one of these reading strips. 
Now you may have one at home. If not, they're easy to, to um, I, what I've done before is, I, let's see if I have it. It's a colored overlay. So down here on the right hand side, um, you can see that it's just one of those, you know, folder inserts. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, you can place that over top of the material and it really just pops out. The words just pop out when you put one of those on. Um, I know my daughter used one through high school and she, I think she liked the yellow one that, and she would just place that over her work or her textbook and it would just really bring the words out and help her pay more attention to, to what she was doing. Right. Um, when what you see on the left hand side are these uh, reusable inserts and this is a great um, way to save paper <laughs> and, um, to have your child work with the material over and over again. So if you want them to go back and redo something, or if you want them to go back and, you know, like, so for example, a concept map, you can just do like one, a piece of paper, draw the concept map, put it in one of these inserts, and then they write on top of the insert with a dry erase pen. And then, you know, they can reuse it over and over again, um, depending on what they're doing. So, those are some ideas uh, to help your child, you know, just basically get to the material and work with it. But what happens when the material might not be at their ability level? And hopefully your child's teacher and, and you and your child's school-based team have worked together on, um, you know, having some IEP goals and having some things that you want your child to do or want the child to learn. And then hopefully they've given you some ways to modify that work or they're modifying the work for you, which is ideal. <laughs> but I know that doesn't always happen. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to walk you through some ways to modify your child's work if it's not at their ability level. Did you want to? Yeah, that sounds that? great. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. Oh, wait. Where am I here? Okay, here we go. So just to recap, and once again, if you've been in IEP meetings, so you'll know that curriculum modifications is a word that is often used um, when we're talking about students who are not working at grade level. And it means to take the curriculum, take the material that has been given at grade level and modify it, make changes to it so it's more suitable to your child's ability level. Now, um, you're not making, um, some these are more significant changes so this is actually the the concepts the content that they're learning so when i was talking about accommodations those were things that you can do to help your child um you know this is a, that's assuming that your child understands and can you know grasp the content that's being presented to them modifications are when your child needs to have um, concepts at a different level than what's being given to them. Right. So um, curriculum modifications, uh, they would most definitely be recorded in your child's IEP if, if they were happening. Um, it's not something that a teacher or a school can do without your, you know, without you knowing, <laughs> basically. And it seems like, oh, there, okay. I didn't know if I was stuck on the wrong side. Good, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, so, I don't know if this is worth going through, but I'm just gonna, in the interest of time, move forward to some actual ideas here. So let's go back here. Um, so when you're modifying, so let's say for example, you're in a situation with your child where you need to do the modif modifications, where you need to do the work. So your child's being sent home some grade level work, or being asked to do some grade level work and it's just above their ability level there you know you really need to um, change what they're going to learn with it so what you need to do is first of all determine what the goal is of that lesson and you can go back to your child's IEP for that um, you can ask the teacher what it is exactly that you want they want your child to learn with that material um, so you need to look at what the purpose of that lesson is and what can your child learn from that lesson? 
What is your child able to do with that lesson? Or what you what do you want them to be able to do with that lesson? And like I said, ideally that's written down uh, in their IEP or the teacher's giving you some sort of direction. Uh, now, then you need to figure out if you're doing this on your own, what you can do to the material to change it, to make it more suitable for your child. And then how do you change it is the next step. And that's kind of where a lot of parents get stuck. <laughs> right. Right. And Kim is here from Iowa and she said, will we have access to this slideshow at all? I don't know if you can share a PDF of it or something, Nicole? Yep, definitely, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. And so definitely. I'll put that as one of the resources that I email out to you guys. So if you wanna type learning in the chat box, um, then you can get an email with additional resources and I can include Nicole's um, PDF there too. Yeah, and, and feel free to email me if you have a question or, you know, um, DM me on Facebook. Um, uh, you know, I often have parents who will message me and say, look, I've got this assignment for my, you know, my student, my child about this assignment, and I just don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to modify it. Can you help me? And I'm happy to have a look at it and just, you know, work, work through it and find a way for your child to learn from it. So, Great. yeah, so feel free. Great. And yeah, so, okay, let's quickly take a step back then and look at how can we change this work to suit our child's ability level. So there are some ways that you can do that. The first thing you can do is you can just alter the difficulty level of the assignment altogether. So you can take the assignment and break it down. So for example, this is a very simple example. On the left hand side is the um, class assignment, the, the assignment that the teacher gave. And it's a very simple one. There's a picture of a dog and then the students are asked to fill in the blanks where the, to identify the parts of the dog. If you wanted to simplify that to make it more suitable for your students, so maybe for example, um, they're not an independent speller yet, or they're not um, an independent reader yet, or they're not, uh, you know, there are certain things that they struggle with in terms of labeling. You can have them, you can simplify this by just simply making a word bank of the parts of the dog and then filling in two of those yourself hmm. and then having them fill in the last one on their own independently. Cool. So that's a very, very simple idea. And just, um, well, and I think word banks are such a great way to help kids right i mean oh. for so many different assignments and yeah. it just gives that extra support and they can be successful and not get so frustrated oh you know? and that's key you really want to find that you know they call it the in psychology they call it this or in education they call it the zone of uh, proximal development and it's just that area where your child isn't struggling so much that they're frustrated, but then they aren't, it's not too easy for them. Right? Right. <laughs> it's just that that zone of where they can do it, maybe with a little bit of prompting, a little bit of support, but but they can do it independent enough to feel proud of themselves and to want to, you know, they're motivated to do more. Right. So, oh, exactly. Um, the next way to modify uh, work is to alter the goal. So for example, Say your child was given a multiplication assignment that the class is working on, and they're not yet learning how to multiply, but they're working, one of their IP, IEP goals is to identify numbers one to 10. Um, this is a simple way of just taking the multiplication sheet and having them pick out numbers that they're working on. So here the student was asked to identify the numbers three and four. And so the student just circled the three and wrote it underneath. But, you know, you don't need to, just because you were sent, you know, you were given a sheet that was at the class level doesn't mean that that's what your child has to work on. <laughs> right. They, you need to make it at your child's level. Um, and I think the other point is, um, you know, given the situation now, is if you do some of these tips that Nicole is sharing with us, 
make sure that you jot it down. And mm -hmm. so when you come back to school, I think it's going to be the fall, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that you can update your About Me profile with new things that you've learned by working with your child of what works. Mm -hmm. uh, because you might be inventing and creating some new accommodations or modifications you know, throughout this springtime and you want to make sure you keep track. Or the other thing is keep track of the ones that didn't work and share those with the teacher because you also want to be aware of that. But I, the positive to me out of this schooling at home situation is that parents, I think, are going to get to know their kids even more and specifically about them as a learner. And they're also going to learn more about the curriculum that the child is getting at school because things are going to be sent home now. Yeah. Um, and so you have, you know, this rich, you know, treasure of nuggets that you're going to be learning even more with your child as a learner that is going to be so helpful for you to share with oh, yeah. now and then for next year, right? Yeah. Um, and if we could go back to word bank just for a minute, Marla said, um, are we just writing the words at the bottom of a worksheet or is there an app that can help? There, there are most definitely apps. You can even just go on Google and have a look at, um, I mean, I think even if you just Google and create word bank, it'll give you an option to, um, you know, put in a passenger reading and then keep out, put a word bank. But I can look around and send a link to you, Charmaine, if you want. Okay. Okay. And, um, and I can't think of a specific off the top of my head because snap to type, you know, doesn't allow, at least I don't think it allows, it doesn't allow you to add a word bank to the worksheet. It would just be taking the photo and typing in the answers, but you can add a word bank. Can you, you add can. a word bank? Yes, actually oh. you can with that. You can oh. because you can type over the, so you take a picture of the worksheet, you upload it to snap type, and then you can actually type on the photo of the worksheet. So you can add the word bank right um, then and there. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that would be cool. So yeah, yeah. I think the snap to type is going to be one of our favorite apps. <laughs> right? I know. I love it. I love it. Exactly. Now, I'm not sure, Charmaine, how much time do we have left? Because I just want to make sure I cover well, some stuff. Yeah. So we have about 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to move through this okay. a little bit quicker Sorry. than just because so, I, I do I keep no, stopping you. <laughs> no 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 worries I'm glad I want to make sure that we're also responding to our to people who are watching. Um so a third way to modify material is to just alter the learning the objectives learning outcomes and a little bit of the content altogether. So for example say the class is working on learning um Plant, learning about plant cells. Well, your child is not working at that level, but rather than having them do something totally different altogether, you know, why not have them grow some plants or, you know, have them and then they can, you know, take care of the plants and look at the growth. And so you're still working within the same theme of what the other students are working with. It's just a different aspect of that theme. So rather than looking, you know, where the class is looking at the cells, your student is learning how to grow plants. So it's still within that theme of plants. Um, and then finally, you can alter how the, um, how the material, I guess, is, so for example, how the child is going to interact with the material, but in a way that's more appropriate for them um, as opposed to what the rest of the class is doing. So that might look like something like this. And, and I believe there's somebody in your Facebook group that created this. Oh, really? Remember okay. for the life oh, of Lisa, is it? We're doing? Huh. Pardon? Was yeah. it Kimber Rice? Um, I, I want to say Lisa Orvis. Oh, oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Lisa Orvis from Wisconsin. And yeah, she's a para up there. And I think she yeah. helped your daughter do this. Yes. Yes. And yeah. I, I'm i sorry, I forgot to put her name as credit. But trust me, on all my presentations, if I show this, I do give her credit. <laughs> this one I pulled off and put together quickly last night. So I apologize. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm usually very much on the ball with giving people credit for their stuff. So, um, but this one here is 
So for example, the class again is learning about plant cells and they're you know, doing this really text intensive um, instruction or you know, working with this, this large amount of text. Um, the alternative is to actually have them do, have your child do something that's more hands-on. So, you know, it's been, the concepts have also been simplified a bit and um, the child is doing a little bit of a different type of lesson, but most importantly, this has become more of a hands-on lesson. So this isn't just about reading text. This is about actually working with the concepts that you want your child to learn or that your child needs to learn. So this is a really great way of having them, you know, move around words, um, find where, you know, certain things belong. It just gives them a whole other way of interacting with the material. Oops. So I'm just gonna run through. So those are the four different ways that you can modify um, your child's work. And those are kind of like the examples that I gave you. Um, I've got more here and I've kind of, they're not in any particular order. They're just, you know, looking at uh, a, a, a class example and then how it can be adapted or modified. And in your book, Inclusion in Action, there are so many good examples. And at the end, I'm going to be scrolling through the comments and picking one lucky winner to win a copy of Nicole's book. Um, so the more comments you make, the more chances you have to win your own book. This is like so good, not only for um, teachers, but also for parents in this time, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so keep yeah. making your comments and we'll be giving that away. Yeah, so the strategy, so some of the ideas that I'm going to show you, like Charmaine said, are in the book and they're written down. So they're, you know, here's the strategy and then there's an example of how it's done. So that's um, that's what the majority of this book is. So if you're looking for really practical ways, like what I'm going to show you now, it's that's what that book is. <laughs> um, and then of course, if you wanna go into my Facebook page and my website, yes. there, there's examples as well. So. In this particular example, um, the child is, uh, this class is learning about the human body, the skeleton, and um, there is a website called Sporkle, S-P-O-R-C-L-E.com, and you can go in and create um, this, this kind of modified assignment for them okay. where they have to label different parts of the skeleton. So they're not labeling the entire skeleton, but it looks like they're only asked to do three parts of the skeleton. And so they're asked to do that um, as opposed to the entire skeleton. But here it just allows you to highlight the different aspects of the skeleton and what you want them to learn. So um, in this next example, this is a typical kind of reading comprehension worksheet that a lot of students get, um, that teachers give out, and that is, um, you know, you read the story and then you answer the questions. Well, if your child uh, is not at that ability level, you can take, for example, say they're learning sight words, you can take sight words from that reading passage and have them do something like match up the sight words. Um, a very simplified approach to, so they're still to that, to that assignment. So they're still, they would still be, you know, learning some aspect of the book or even reading along with the rest of the class, but what they're being asked to do and learn is a lot different. And this is a more, you know, simplified version of it, but keeping it within the same theme. Right, right. So you're not giving them something totally different. Um, and Kim um, had another question, I'm sorry. She said, does Nicole have any pros or cons about introducing a calculator or certain criteria that should be met before we introduce that option? No, use it. <laughs> no, <laughs> use it. <laughs> I don't, I honestly, you know, we use calculators even when we don't need to. I mean, in our, in our, adult, our adult life. <laughs> right. So, um, because, it, especially when, you're, when your student is learning um, content or math concepts where there's several steps required, you don't want them to get stuck on 
what four plus nine is. You know, you want them to, that's not the focus of the assignment, right? So just, yeah, teach them how to use a calculator, teach them, you know, uh, when it can be used. And I, you know, I don't, I don't agree with withholding it, <laughs> basically. Um, so I hope that answered yes, the question. So the next example of a modified work is this one where uh, the class is working on subtracting three digit numbers. Your child is working on subtracting one, di you know, single digit numbers. And, um, whoops. <laughs> and this is simply just something that you can do and cross out the rest of the numbers. Just, you know, blank out the rest of the numbers that they don't need to work with. So it's quite an easy way of modifying work. Um, here's another one. Now, um, I've seen this used many, many times successfully. This is when the student is has a spelling list to work with. So the class has a spelling list to work with and the student wants to participate in that spelling list, but the words might be a little bit above their conceptual or their ability level. You can find smaller words within that larger word for your child to learn. So this is an example of taking um, grade five spelling list servant, and then um, they've picked out the word ant, and then the child has learned how to spell the word ant. So they're still participating in the spelling list, and they're still participating in, you know, learning the same types of words and hearing the same types of words, but they're just learning a simpler word within the larger word. So. Um, this one here, I did use snap type for, and is it snap to type or snap type? I don't know. Either one, I think, okay. will get you there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is an example of how you can use snap type. Um, so here on the left is the worksheet, and you take a photo of it, you upload it to snap type, and then you can type over the original instructions to make it more appropriate for your child. Let's see. I haven't I haven't done that feature, so I'm so excited to learn yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, cool. no, it's yeah, and you can do this even with. Um, I think you could even do this on your computer, like with huh. preview. I think in the in preview mode. Oh right, I, I know, and I'm cool. yeah, I'm learning more about how to change PDFs too. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is an, and. If we could pause for a minute, Wyana had a question, which I think is really important is, how do you find the right level and not oversimplify schoolwork so that not too hard, not too easy right there? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Trial and error. <laughs> Trial and error. And then, of course, you can also go to the, um, if you're looking for a specific goal, you can also go to the core curriculum, for example, if your state is using it, and look at the subject level and look at the different learning objectives for each grade. And you'll, it's, um, it's a scaffolded approach, right? So you can look at, you know, what concepts are being taught in the early years in that strand and then what concepts are being taught in the upper years and maybe try and find where your student fits on that continuum of goals. Yeah and I, and I think a lot of states have like you know they're called different things like alternative you know standards or yeah, you know, essential like, elements. Yes yes yeah, yeah. Um, and that can give you a lot of good ideas so um, you know, if you need help finding that, you know, tell me what state you live in and I yeah. can help you go to that website because you really want to be in your state specific, um, mm -hmm. you know, website to look for that. But yeah, that can be really helpful. And also share that with the teachers because sometimes the teachers forget the resources there, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Know. Or they don't know. Right. Um, in the interest of wrapping this up very quickly, uh, I've here's an example of Snap Type and how you can use it on the left hand side. And so that's an app. The other one I really recommend is um, going to the Sherlock Center. 
So if you just Google Sherlock Center, they have all these books that are adapted and modified. So with visuals, so they're great for, you know, if your class, if your if your child is their class is reading a certain novel, you can look it up on this site and get an adapted version of it or a modified version of it. Um, the other two sites I'd recommend Austin and Lily. If you haven't already come across that site, she does um, great work with taking concepts and breaking them down and making them really um, achievable for students. And um, lessonpicks.com, if you are making any kind of visual uh, kind of, um, you know, type work for your student, if you need any sort of pictures or visuals, it's there on lessonpicks.com. Um, and then finally, you can go to a live finder that I've created. It's a site online, yes. and it's got a collection of modified lessons that are already been, uh, they've already been created, they're already there. And it's at bit.ly forward slash modified lessons. And there's, and it's kind of like a crowdsourcing. So, you know, people are sending me their lessons and I'm kind of collecting them in this one area. And um, that's it. That's hey. for now, that I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was so good. I just, um, like I said, I love um, learning from you and picking up new ideas and, um, I know different people in the chat have been sharing um, resources. So yeah. thank you for doing that because that that's what this is all about. I mean, I do this weekly show, but I want it to be something that's going to be useful for you. And also that we just grow this community of people that help each other, right? Yeah. Um, especially now we, we need to get support from each other. Um, so I'm going to scroll through the comments mm -hmm. and find a lucky winner of inclusion and in action. So I, it's a real high tech way of doing this. <laughs> Close my eyes <laughs> and I go scroll through the comments and I stop and I stopped on Kimberly's comment. <laughs> so Kimberly, Yay! you get a copy of Nicole's book. Um, so I just, you can just send me a private message with your address and I might have it because Kimberly's in our membership group, our trailblazer group. Um, but Kimberly, that'll be so cool. You can use that now. And then, you know, if you want, you can let your teacher borrow <laughs> it too. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that's a book that um, I encourage others to look for. And even these kinds of educational books, you can often ask your local library if they don't have a copy of it to buy it. I've had people do that, um, even though the libraries are closed right now. <laughs> yeah. But in the future, it would be there for you to check out. So there are a number of ways that you can get that. And then also just yeah. to go to um, Nicole's website, yeah, the inclusive class where she has her blog posts and a, a lot of resources there and to like her Facebook page um, because she's always posting wow. more great ideas there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I've also, I also have my own personal website, Nicole .com, If you, oh, okay. um, and that just has information on, on other things that I do. So yeah, okay. but cool. it's such a pleasure to be here and, and be back <laughs> to you again. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, it's fun and it's, um, you know, it's a nice way that we can still connect with people. Um, yeah. I know kids are doing this with their classmates and their classes. Um, if your teacher hasn't had some kind of a Google Hangout or a Zoom meeting, I would really, you know, encourage you to suggest that because mm -hmm. I know my grandkids are, are missing their classmates and they love using the technology to get back in touch with them. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, that would be nice yeah. too. Um, the other thing before we close, I wanted to say is I'm really keeping these weekly Facebook lives fluid according to what's happening and according to what you need at the moment. So I'll be putting up some questions on my Facebook page, Voices, Visions and Voices together um, to see what topics you would like for next week um, because I wanna make sure that it's really helpful. So um, thank you again, Nicole, for being with us. My pleasure and thank you everybody who's tuned in to watch and who will watch. I appreciate it. And um, I just love sharing, you know, ideas and resources with others. So if you need anything specific, let me know. <laughs>
Thank you. And we will get a copy of Nicole's slides that we can include in the resources that come. So if you haven't yet, type the word learning to get um, more resources sent to you next week. And um, I hope everyone is well in your family and people are staying healthy and staying at home. Um, and until next Thursday, I am Charmaine Tanner. Thank you for being with us and we shall see you next week. Bye. Bye, Nicole. Bye. -bye. <laughs> and